Welcome to the Inspiration North podcast, inspiring stories from inspirational people and how they found their passion, their true north. I'm James Eaves. And I'm Michelle Minikin. And this is the Inspiration North podcast. Today's podcast, good mental health is the big umbrella. Without it, there's nothing with Emily Pearson. We talk about her battle to get well, the importance of asking if someone is okay, and mental health first aiders in the workplace need proper support. Emily is a visionary and thought leader in the corporate mental health field. She is a corporate mental health program expert with 20 years experience and qualifications, enabling her to work as a professional in the mental health, substance misuse and health and social care fields. Emily has designed and delivered safe and ethical approaches to corporate mental health culture change with synergistic outcomes from changing lives to return on investment, creating mass mindset change to community impact. Emily's programs have been proven to work in all industries they have been embedded into, from emergency services and traditional male oriented industries to public services and blue chip companies. Emily has driven change throughout her career, which all began after her own lived experience of severe mental health problems in her early 20s. Her recovery ignited her passion, which has motivated her to provide education, support, treatment and guidance to thousands of people across the UK. From young people in secure and community settings, to adults with dual diagnosis and homelessness, to four years ago focusing on employee mental health, bringing her 20 years experience to the workplace. So, Emily, what did you want to be when you grew up? So that was a really interesting question, actually, from reading it on there, because it really made us think about what I wanted to be when I grew up. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I even knew. I think for me, as a child growing up, I was never... I was never pushed into any direction at all, which Mm. I think was good. But, however, I also wasn't really mm, made too aware of the importance of education so Mm. I didn't particularly like it junior school was probably quite cool but I don't really remember very much of that senior school was just a nightmare for me Mm. and I think once I hit puberty and went into senior school um, that is where you know you're supposed to start thinking about your future and what you want to study and what you want to focus on and for me at that time that was when my parents were starting to kind of split up really so that was really really difficult being a teenager puberty and having to deal with your parents breaking up mm. and one of the strangest things about it when I think back about it is when you're a child you don't understand the impact of what's going on around mm. you. So you're just living it. You're just in it and experiencing it without really paying attention to what's going on. And one of the strangest things that I found about when my mum and dad were obviously falling out of love, it wasn't that they argued. In fact, it was the complete opposite. They didn't speak to each other. And they literally lived in opposite ends of the house all the time. So oh. they were never in the same room together. Um, so it was like that passive aggressive stuff that was going on so Mm -hmm. it wasn't the arguing and I think the arguing would have been probably been better because then you go yes I I, I can connect that argument Mm -hmm. to that something's not quite right but when there's no contact between them at all it becomes really difficult Mm. so I think that was a that was a huge challenge for me so going through um, early puberty you know, senior school, things that were going on at home um, really stopped me from focusing in on school anyway. I became bored of it quite quickly. Mm. I couldn't concentrate. Um, I would get into trouble quite often at school. I was seen as a bit of a rebel. (laughs) I probably still am. (laughs) 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 Um, But so, yeah, so that was a really difficult question to ask her what did you want to be because I really didn't want to be anything my brain just wasn't thinking about that at all Um, I wasn't focused on the future I didn't have ambitions and left school when I was 
before I'd even turned 16 because I wasn't allowed to take half of my uh, exams because I just wasn't turning up for school anyway. Mm. Um, I didn't enjoy being there. And obviously the problems that were happening at home, um, I would play the Nick quite often. <laughs> Do they still use that term? I play have the no Nick? idea. <laughs> It'll be something much more uh, cooler nowadays, I bet. Yeah, we can get away with it. I lived at school, so... <laughs> Like, where's Michelle? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hiding under the bed. I know, I was like, no, I refuse to come down to history. I hate it. <laughs> I actually loved history, but you know. I did. <laughs> so, yeah, so that, that, that was kind of my teenage years for me. Mm. Um, so I think I was around about 15 when my mum and dad actually split up. So that silence had been going on for a long time before they actually split up. And when they did split up, my father left home but mm-hmm. he didn't just leave home he actually left the country and went to america and studied aikido there for a couple of years mm-hmm. and before that had happened i had a really strong relationship with my dad he would take me out walking he taught me how to fish you know i, I was probably treated as if i was you know his son really mm-hmm. um i wasn't a very girly girl i was always tomboyish i was willing to get mucky and pick up frogs and you know do all the gross <laughs> stuff that a lot of girls might not particularly like doing at that age but I loved it so my dad leaving home was a huge loss for me mm. but I didn't realize that until I was much older yeah. I didn't realize that it was a loss but looking back now it was it was almost like a bereavement yeah. um I had a younger sister who was three years I still have a younger mm-hmm. sister who was <laughs> three years younger than me so she was still at home with me and my mum and my relationship began to break down from there with my mum because obviously I just turned even wilder I was running away from home all the time bringing be having to be brought home by the police quite often (laughs) you know and like I I mean I laugh about it now but actually I was really troubled Mm. I was a troubled child you know I was using drugs I was I wasn't doing what I should have been doing and I wasn't just a naughty child. I was actually really struggling with the things that had been going on in my home life. Um, my relationship broke down with my mum because of that. She obviously couldn't cope with the stress of that relationship on top of um, her breaking up with my, my dad. And by the time I was 16, I'd, I'd left home and was living on my own. Mm. So that time when you're supposed to be focusing on your future and your education, I definitely wasn't focusing on any of that at all. No. So that was up to 16 and once I reached 16 and I was living on my own, I thought it was brilliant, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't. When I look back at it, I remember the first uh, place that I had, it was, um, and it was like a flat, but it was on two levels and I used to sleep on the sofa downstairs because I was just so frightened of sleeping in the bedroom. Mm. It just felt so big and being 16 year old on your Mm -hmm. own, it was actually quite a scary thing. Um, Again, still using cannabis quite often so my mental health wasn't particularly at its best then anyway Mm -hmm. and I think that relation that that point in my life was what kind of funneled me into looking for something that I was missing and what I was looking for I mean I didn't recognize it at that time these are things that you start to like learn about yourself as you as you look back and you you know you you see the therapist about what's gone on and what's happened and looking back then that for me was the reason why I got involved in a relationship who was who is now my my daughter's father mm-hmm. so she's my daughter's 22 now so that, that's how long just how long ago that was um he was a little bit older than me and it was a really really difficult relationship mm-hmm. um there was there was violence and there, there was abuse in there and I was put in hospital by him when I was six months pregnant with Abby and she ended up coming about six weeks early mm. so I was looking for something I was 16 year old living on my own you know my m- relationship had broken down with my mom I didn't have anyone to go to my dad wasn't there my sister was younger than me you know so she was only 13 at the time I literally had nobody who I could turn to mm. and I think that's why I ended up in such a difficult relationship at that point um which then became you know very very difficult to get out of once you're that age and yeah. relationships are completely different when you're younger than than t- to when you're that little bit older mm-hmm. <laughs> um so by the time i was 18 i'd had abby um 
and you know i beat my my daughter's 22 now and when i i look at her i'm like there's no way could she have a child and I keep saying to her, no babies, not ready to be a nana. <laughs> I'm only 42. <laughs> Don't put us through that trauma. Um, but yeah, and I'm just like, there's no way that she's old enough or mature enough. Yeah, I was four years younger than her when mm. I had, had that baby. And I thought that I was mature enough and, you know, was able to do this. Mm. And I think if you were to ask us what is one of my biggest achievements in my life it's been bringing up abby mm. from such a young age so by the time i had abby i, I, I hadn't I'd had no gcse's <laughs> left school with nothing you know re- really bit of a no hoper and i think abby really changed my life around mm. and it was having her that made us realize I needed to to do something with my life. Yeah. So I uh, eventually left a father when she was just, I think she was about a year old. Um, and I was like, right, brilliant. This is the start of my new life. And then all of a sudden I ended up with serious mental health problems. And it for me, it was literally, I had gone through the trauma and loss of my father, the breakup with my mom, you know, living on my own. Um, and then being in an abusive relationship and having a baby in the space of literally six years mm. as a as a teenager, it just all hit us. Um, and I was really, really unwell. I had panic disorder. I was having panic attacks all the time. Severe depression where I couldn't get out of bed. Um, anxiety was just horrendous. And I think that my anxiety led to an eating disorder where I was just so anxious all the time. I couldn't make decisions and some of those decisions had to be about food. Mm. So I just got to the point where I was just like, I can't even eat. I just couldn't even make a decision on what I wanted to eat. Mm-hmm. And so that was the end of my, yes, I'm going to get my life together. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and became really unwell for around about two years. Mm-hmm. So from there... It took me about two years to recover. So at that point, you know, I'd, I'd had a couple of jobs working um, in a local hairdresser's, um, in a tanning shop, you know, but always knew that I wanted to do something with my life and mm-hmm. did want to actually have a career, um, but didn't really know what. But once I recovered from my mental illness, I realized exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to understand more about the brain, understand what had just happened to me. Like a lot of people who have a mental health problem and then they recover from it, Mm. they want to understand more about themselves. And then once you begin to understand more about it, you then begin to understand more, not just about you, but about mental health and the brain just in general. So that was what sparked my interest really was just the recovery from that. Mm -hmm. And I realized how important our mental health is. It is the big umbrella because like I say, for me, when my brain had gone kaput, I couldn't even decide what I wanted to eat. I couldn't even get out of bed. You know, that wasn't my physical health. That was my brain inside of the, yeah, at that point, 20 years ago, you know, people were more talked a lot more about your physical health and Mm. how important it was to have a healthy heart and you know reduce cancer and quit smoking and all of that stuff so that was um a bit of a an eye-opener for me Mm. and because of that that gave me the direction in which I wanted to go down and I went back to college university studied psychology studied counseling um became um kind of try to find ways into a career of what I thought I wanted to do at that point which was working with young people Mm -hmm. because that's what I was I was still a young person that was where my experience was um so I ended up working with young people um with mental health problems who were in secure units and that's where my career started Mm -hmm. Uh, I think I was around about 20 21 I think I was 21 because you had to be over 21 to, to work in this place because it was such high security and because of the young people you were working with. Um, so that was the, that was my story, which feels very self-indulgent because it's not very often I tell it in that much depth. Mm. If I tell my lived experience, it's usually 
um, at the beginning of a conference or as I'm about to deliver a workshop or some training just to say not only am I a professional with all these years experience I have lived experience on top of that as well mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's not very often I actually sit and just go blah you know <laughs> <laughs> and let it all out no, so it's good. it feels a little bit self-indulgent to do that actually um, because the focus for me isn't about con it's not about telling my story over and over again no. it's about how do we help people to prevent them from going through something similar to me but also if somebody is going through that how they can get support because from the lessons that I learned going through my and to be fair I have had um, had mental health challenges since that day you know yeah. they've, they've, they've they've come and gone they've never been as severe as they were but i have gone had small kind of relapses where i've become uh, unwell to the point where i haven't been able to work for a short amount of time but nothing as sev severe as that is nobody would nobody talked about it even when i had anorexia you know i was like stick thin and i'm not a stick thin girl i wasn't mm. a stick thin girl to start off with i've always been you know curvy chunky whatever you want to call it <laughs> and you know so to then become like a size eight to ten was massive yet nobody was saying anything nobody was saying are you all right um mm. and it was just like people just got on with it mm. um and the recovery was really difficult as well i tried a couple of different types of antidepressants two of them i couldn't tolerate one of them i could tolerate but um did the help maybe who knows you don't know whether it's just the passage of time that you're recovering and the other things that you're doing um cbt i learned cbt which i found really useful mm -hmm. i think out of everything cbt continues to help me now yeah um and it's not for everybody but but for me it, it really worked but nobody would talk about it nobody was having these conversations and i remember my partner at the time um, it was more about oh you're miserable you're not the same person who you were who you were when I, w I met you because I am quite bubbly and outgoing and loud mm -hmm. <laughs> must be the blondes <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah so people were w nobody really ever sat me down and said you know what I'm really worried about you mm. it was a battle that I had to actively participate in to become well again because if I just become completely helpless and engulfed by my mental illness mm. I would never have got well no. I'd have been stuck in that I had to you know motivate myself to get out of bed to take that tablet to hope that something was going to work and the recovery for that was long mm. um even to the point today i still have challenges with food like i'm always on some kind of wacky diet um the latest one is that i don't i haven't eaten sugar or carbohydrates for the past four years and that for me is actually good for my mental health because it, it sugar and carbs just do something to me that it just my body and my brain don't like it anyway mm -hmm. but but then I'm also thinking, am I doing it because of that? Or is this also, you know, do you ever recover from an eating disorder? Because I have spent all of my life since then on diets, trying different ways of losing weight and obsessing about your diet, what you're eating, how mm. you look. So I don't think you ever fully recover for long. Um be, especially if things happen in your life that then makes you slip back again yeah it's about control isn't it mm. so you're controlling what you're putting into your body you know people say that sugar's worse than crack yeah um, <laughs> well i've never tried crack <laughs> just for the record <laughs> <Neither have I. laughs> but it's very addictive so you know there's low there's i remember it's probably about four years ago there was a massive you know davina mccall there's that no sugar thing mm. so yeah you probably you probably bag on trend when it comes yeah. to diets <laughs> yeah well that's it and I, I, do you know what i do love it if i have i call them relapses mm. because sugar is that addictive you can go quite a length of time without eating sugar and carbohydrates but when you're craving it you're craving it mm. and i've seen me <laughs> dragging my partner to the garage at 11 o'clock at night with our jammers on and hoodies up <laughs> 
come on let's go and get some chocolate but you know i eat it and then the next day i'm ill it can yeah. it can make us feel quite unwell yeah. um so you know the the, the fun mm. doesn't last long does it? it only lasts while it's in it's your like mouth and then it is that's exactly what it is um, and you don't realize just how bad it is for you until you don't have it in your system. Mm. You know, if you stop eating um, lettuce tomorrow, <laughs> it's not going to make any bit of difference to your body. But as soon as you cut sugar out, you know, you become unwell for those first five days while your body's burning the rest of it up. Mm. And then it goes, oh, we've got none left. And it starts to panic and you get these cravings and you get what, what people can call the keto flu. Because if you think about a hybrid car, Mm-hmm. You've got two different types of um, energy, haven't you? You've got your petrol and then you've got your electric. Uh, so our bodies, apparently, from the research that I, I've done into it, um, the natural fuel is ketones. Mm-hmm. So when we are in starvation mode, um, our body burns, creates these ketones, which we burn for fuel. And that's how humans have managed to survive so long. We don't we don't starve to death. We can find this this new energy. But then we found sugar and we started eating sugar, didn't we? And then obviously the brain just loved that, full of the dopamine hits. And um, we're at the point now where our diets are literally just full of the stuff. Mm. Whereas, you know, when Homo erectus was running around looking for sugar, he was lucky if he found some some honey. Yeah, it, it really wasn't really ready available no. for us. So our bodies haven't evolved to keep up with the way that our diets have changed and they've changed mm. so quickly. Yeah, I think in America, the high fructose corn syrup Ooh. is even worse for you. Yeah. Because I don't think the body particularly breaks that down very well. And so my friend in Texas, she, you know, when she comes across here, she's like, oh, the, the Coke has got sugar in it. It's brilliant. You yeah. Know? Um, but it's dangerous, isn't it? Yeah. Well, this is it. And the, the high dish and all sorts of foods. So that's probably one of the biggest challenges when you're, you're not eating sugar is trying to find food that doesn't have sugar in so mm. when i go into this giant supermarket i literally shop in the veg aisle mm. <laughs> and the meat aisle and that's all you because everything is just hidden in everything yeah, even like mm. jars of like pasta sauces yeah. even when you're buying um sort of ready cooked mm-hmm. ready cooked chicken breasts you look on the back it's got mm. sugar in it yeah it's yeah. bonkers it is mm. It is, yeah. yeah, and that's without even going into all the preservatives and the chemicals that they use. So, I feel much healthier on on that diet. And I know if my diet has slipped, then I, I start to feel it. But I, I feel it more emotionally. Mm. Um, I think I must have my mental health. Um, my brain's very sensitive. I think to um, to lots of things, um, and and I can tell. You know, I really can tell. I'm very, very conscious of the way that I feel. And I don't know if that's because I've had mental health problems that you just become ultra sensitive to it. Uh, but I am very, very conscious in like shifts in moods. And um, and a lot, of, a lot of those moods can be daily. Like I say, I've never been as bad as I was in my early 20s, but I have constant mental health challenges. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk a wee bit about... Um, what you're doing now okay so how did it so talk yeah tell us a bit about how you got to where you are now and what you're doing yeah so when I started working in the mental health field working with young people in the criminal justice system um, my kind of special focus was on substance misuse Mm. because again that was just something that I related to and and had that lived experience of Um, and I loved it I really did love working with young people um i found that i connected with them quite well obviously i was only kind of 21 at the time Mm -hmm. so i wasn't like who's this old woman talking to me about what i'm doing (laughs) it was kind of much closer in age then um and from there i spent probably spent about 10 years working with young people specifically Mm -hmm. but in in varying different settings so with criminal justice out in the community in schools and it was all around substance misuse intervention um, and obviously, if we're talking substance misuse with you, young people, we're generally talking about mental health as well. Mm. So it kind of mm. came hand in hand. Um, but, you know, really stressful jobs as well. That, you know, you, you have a lot of responsibility for keeping young people safe. Mm-hmm. So you, we would work really closely with, um, with the local police 
we would work really closely with social work mm. um and adult services so you know you, we, we were able to wrap around those services around young people to make sure that they got the support in all directions so yeah that i really enjoyed that i think it was around about maybe it's about 2012 um I'd been working with young people in looked after care and that was quite stressful. Mm. So you were working long hours, night shifts, majority of your night shifts when you should have been asleep, you were awake because one of the young people would have run away or the police had had to be called. Um, so it was quite a stressful job. Uh, a lot of restraining young people as well, which obviously is quite a stressful thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it got to the point where I'd started to look at doing something else. I thought, you know, what what else can I do? Um, it was a starting again, you know, to affect my mental health. I'm you know, very aware I've been doing this last long now and maybe I need to look at where I can focus somewhere else. Uh, so that was when I qualified as a, a trainer. So my qualification specifically in health and social care training. Mm -hmm. And I thought, right, you know, I've been doing this for 10 years now. I'm sure I've got some kind of knowledge I can start passing on to other people. Um, and started to take that that turn in my career and looking at, at becoming a trainer instead. So I did a lot of work for a local council around training in substance misuse um, and mental health before... I decided that I wanted to work with adults. Mm -hmm. um, from when I started working with adults, it was just a completely different story. And what was quite interesting was you could almost see the transition from the young people who you were working with to the potential of how they could end up. Mm. Um, and that was actually quite, it was quite worrying because I felt like all of that hard work that you thought that you'd done to help young people to maybe get back in their family homes or, you know, to come off substances and not be involved in criminal activities, that actually the chance of it working was really, really slim. Mm. And that's how it felt. You know, it felt mm. like I probably didn't do that much to help people. Um, not because of me, not because I was so bad. <laughs> uh, you know, we can't fix people, but also we can't fix cultures and we can't fix poverty. And a lot of the problems were kind of stemming from those areas. Mm. So when I started working with adults, um, I started working with adults who were homeless in shelters, obviously substance misuse, high levels of mental health, um, usually schizophrenia mm. and drug use on top of that so again really high highly stressful job you do it night shifts again but just loved the work that I was able to do and connecting with people and you know at least help trying to help mm. by you know signposting them or making sure that they had the support when they needed it um and then I think it was about four years ago I had the opportunity to start to work with um, a local mind and was very very lucky to be a part of the national mind team mm -hmm. that designed the blue light program so the blue light program is a national program and it's basically going into um, emergency services and delivering a mental health program for them for their staff so like we talk about workplace well-being and workplace mental health it was basically that but for the emergency services and I loved it. I loved the idea of designing this, you know, all the research that was being put in by mind to better understand what the problems were. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there was huge problems around kind of the cultures, very male dominated, you know, very kind of masculine and macho. Um, and when I remember the first first session I ever delivered, there was about 25 guys all in black stab vests on everything all sat there with their arms folded looking at me going what are you going to tell me about today you know I've seen it all I've heard it all there's nothing at all you can tell and at the beginning of the session they were like quite quiet and just obviously trying to check us out and you know wonder what what she's going to say by the end of it we couldn't shut them up mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was just about creating this safe space for people to have these conversations about what the problems were so that we could feed that back to the senior team. But also 
what support that they felt that they needed. Mm -hmm. They were um, the research that mine did was shown like s frightening amounts of mental health problems. Um, but even more worrying, I mean, the kind of statistic that gets thrown around so often is one in four of us in any one given year will experience a mental health problem. It's definitely higher than one in four. That statistic's been around for 26 years now. Mm. <laughs> um, but for the emergency services, it were they the research showed that one in four emergency service workers had actually thought about taking their own lives. Mm -hmm. So some of these statistics were like really frightening, it was like we need to do something about this. So working with the emergency services and National Mind um, was my first um, role really into the workplace. Before that, it was all about community work. It was mm -hmm. all about supporting people out in the community, um, training. Um, designing programs for communities and professionals to, to be delivered to them. So that was this was my first experience working in, in, in the workplace and bringing my experience into the workplace. And I loved it. And the program was just so positive um, and was so successful that I thought, you know what, if we can do this in the emergency services, then we can do it anywhere. Um, so that's how I've ended up where I am today, by designing programs specifically for workplaces um, because they need to be tailored. Everybody's culture is different. You know, yes, we all have people in there and it is a human problem, but there are very unique differences with cultures in workplaces as well that we need to think about. So that's basically what Our Minds Work do. So Our Minds Work, um, how old are we now? We've become up to the end of our first year mm -hmm. um, and we've just, our feet haven't hit the ground really in the first year. As you can imagine, there's a lot of work out there. It's a really hot topic at the moment. Um, and we have basically designed three packages um, from what we specialize in. Mm -hmm. So the first package is what we call our culture change package. And that's around, you know, the whole culture change piece where are we starting? What do we want to achieve? How do we get to that point? Um, and the way we do that is we work with everybody from CEO to frontline staff. It makes no sense to go into an organization and just train 20 people in mental health first aid mm -hmm. or train half of your managers in spotting signs and symptoms. It just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So we target the knowledge and information that people need depending on what role they are having in the workplace. And we look at it... Um, that everybody has a responsibility. I know we talk a lot about work-related stress, but everybody has a responsibility for work-related stress. We also stress ourselves out. Mm -hmm. We also stress other people out. So we all have to take responsibility for what, what things can I do to manage or prevent my own stress. Um, and as an employer, what should an employer be doing to prevent and manage work-related stress from their part as well? So... Um, we look at it as it's everybody's responsibility. And at the end of the day, if you've got 100 employees, that's 100 brains. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the chances are some of those brains are not going to be able to function at some point. Um, it could be caused by work, which is something that we definitely need to stop from happening. Um, but it could also be caused by other things as well. And I think as a, a responsible employer, it's about making sure that the support there and that people are able to go, actually, I am worried about you. You know, do you want to talk about it? Which was something that I, I never, ever had, no. mm -hmm. you know, throughout that time. So so our culture change program is, it's been, we've been doing that for about a couple of years now. Um, and it works really well. Our second program is what we've just launched. So we, we've literally just launched this we've been working on it the past kind of seven months and this came about from um a lot of my concerns that i was having around mental health first aid have mm. you heard of mental health first aid yeah so <laughs> mental health first aid training brilliant for what it was designed for it was designed for anyone to attend in the community go along to a training course learn more about mental health, recognize signs and symptoms that somebody was experiencing a crisis, mm -hmm. be able to support that person in that moment 
ring the emergency services, walk away and never see that person again. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Yeah, everybody should have the skills to be able to do that. But what happened was the past four years, as we've seen um, a huge marketing campaign to put mental health first aid into the workplace, that doesn't happen in the workplace. And as soon as you put somebody into a new role, because this is then a role, mm -hmm. the role has an expectation, it has mm -hmm. responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Because you are a person in a role in a workplace, you're now culpable for um, organizational policies and procedures. Mm -hmm. All of this stuff, mental health first aid training does not cover mm -hmm. at all. So the, if the train, mental health first aid training is saying some, you know, you're supporting somebody who's just said they're, they're about to take their own lives, ring the emergency services, tell someone, okay, and maybe he's out, you know, out in the community that works really well. You're telling someone you're ringing the emergency services, that's the end of that, but mm -hmm. that doesn't work in the workplace. No. We need to be able to keep people safe, and we need to show how we're keeping people safe as well. So um, we designed, um, it's basically a, have you heard of a service blueprint before? Yeah. Okay. So for people who don't know what a service blueprint is, is McDonald's probably has a service blueprint. So their McDonald's all look the same. They have the same customer journey. They all say the same things. They promote mm -hmm. the same stuff. So if McDonald's wanted to create a new McDonald's, um, they would have a service blueprint which somebody could pick up and then design step by step a replica of how the other mcdonald's are running so that's everything from the way that it looks and the structure all the way to uh, how they recruit employees the lot so this is basically what we've designed we've designed a, a service blueprint which is a step-by-step -step guide and that if you are going to have mental health first aiders or mental health advocates in the workplace we have to do it properly mm. you know this is a huge role for people and People who generally want to be involved in this role probably have their own lived experience of a mental health problem as well. So we'll have to take that into account. So the service blueprint provides all the structure, advice and guidance on what you need to do mm -hmm. before you start to recruit these people, because there are a lot of things that needs to be in place um, before you even recruit people. Mm. You've got to have a better understanding of why you're doing this. What's the role? What's the expectations? Mm -hmm. Have your stress risk assessed the role, which, you know, HSE recommend that you should do. So we cover all of that. We then cover the safe recruitment. So who are these people? Should anybody just be allowed to be a mental health first aider? Mm. We, we found we found through working with some of the emergency services that people would put themselves forward into this role because promotions were coming up. Mm. So we'll have to better understand, mm. you know, who are the people that we need in this role? What are their motivations to be in this role? Are they well enough right now to be in this role? So helping them to, to self-reflect on that, you know, um, you know how, how dealing with a colleague who was talking about bereavement or um, depression or even thoughts of suicide, how is that going to affect them? You know, we need to protect people's mental health as well as provide support. Mm -hmm. um, promoting them is a, you know, a really interesting thing. <laughs> a lot of people, uh, and uh, um, you know, one thing to think about here is when we're talking about businesses and organizations, they don't have mental health professionals in there. Mm -hmm. So they don't understand um, some of the terminology and some of the things that we have to think about where people like yourself and I would understand what safeguarding means. Um, whereas safeguarding to companies means if you have employees under the age of 18 generally mm -hmm. and the cluster as a young person. Mm -hmm. But if somebody is saying that they're about to take their own lives, that person is a vulnerable adult who needs safeguarding. Companies don't have safeguarding policies in place. They don't understand the meaning of confidentiality and breaching confidentiality in this manner. So we've seen confidentiality being breached all over the place, mm. which, you know, if that came to the forefront, who's going to be culpable for that? The organization. Mm. Yeah. So, so we're not only seeing mm. risks for employees, we're also seeing business risks coming out of this because the the structure um, and the training and the right level of knowledge just mm. just isn't isn't there. So that's our employee mental health advocate blueprint. 
So if people are starting up from scratch, we have our own two day training um, and the blueprint which runs alongside it. If companies have mental health first aid is already in place, we have a one day converter course alongside the blueprint. Mm -hmm. So they've done all the mental health stuff. What they need to know is practically, mm. what do I need to do? Mm. What policies and procedures am I culpable for? If Bobby's just come in and told us that he's drinking alcohol at four o'clock in the morning because of his anxiety and then driving around on a digger all day, chances are you're probably going to have to breach confidentiality for health and safety reasons. Mm. Yeah, that isn't covered in mental health first aid training. So we're, we're leaving companies wide open to potential risks and people and people's lives as well. Mm. So that is our our second program. Um, our ongoing program from there is what we call the membership program so once people are in this role you know we need to continue to look after them we need to continue to provide support we need to continue to provide them with development and training or else you've just given them a two-day course and going there you go crack on mm. sheep dip <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah. There's certificate. Yeah. yeah, there's your certificate. <laughs> Bye -bye. Crack on. And pe it frightens people, mm. you know. It either frightens them to the point where they're inactive and they're not doing anything, so you've just wasted all that money, or mm. they go above and beyond what their role is because the expectations have never really been set <laughs> out. I'm going to counsel people. Yeah. No, you shouldn't. Yes, <laughs> and that is exactly a reality. Yeah. Mm. Um, they may not think that they're doing that, but then mm. you hear, oh, well, yes, I've met with Sheila um, a couple of times this week, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, mm. <laughs> quite worrying. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, you know, we have to keep people safe. It's actually frightening mm. to the point where, you know, I literally couldn't sleep at night. I was going home at... You know, we were initially delivering mental health first training. I just said, we need to stop. This is not right. Just training people in this two day course and then going by. Mm -hmm. It just uh, ethically, it wasn't right for me and it definitely wasn't right for the business. So we just knocked it all on the head and then said, right, well, there are now 400,000 mental health first aiders across the UK right now. Semi, semi counselors. There's a lot of people out there who are now potentially at risk. Um, we are hearing more and more of people coming to work and taking their own lives at work. We've opened the doors in the workplace and gone, come and talk to us about your mental health with no training, mm -hmm. no education, no support other than the EAP in place. And this is what's happening. People mm. are feeling much more comfortable in the workplace with reducing stigma. And it's we ha we've got no safety net no safety net in place at mm. all and having mental health first aid is, is not a safety net mm. in fact having them mm. creates more problems without that structure around to support them it's the almost business. just a starting point to uncover something which that then needs a deeper level of someone who's more qualified to mm. deal with mm. a more in-depth issue yeah proper counseling services yeah. or yeah it's so i can see why that would open a box mm -hmm. yeah and is it, legally speaking, I don't know the law, but do companies have to, is there a, something that's compulsory? The company needs to have something of this or is it merely just a voluntary, I've heard mental health's a big thing in the workplace. It seems like something we've got to spend some money on so we'll do that or is it just... Yeah, there's no legislation. There's nothing at the moment. No, I'd imagine with know. time, perhaps the governments will, the governments, the government will probably look to bring something in do you think is that the case or? well the ha this this has been a bit of a journey mm. so mental health first aid totally changed the way that the market they didn't change the course they just marketed mm -hmm. it into the workplace mm. um iosh um and hsc have both done research into the efficacy of mental health first aid and mm. their reports weren't positive mm -hmm. they were bringing up all of the concerns that i've just mentioned there um yeah it's still happening um just before christmas is that there was a petition to get um to get it into parliament to make mm. mental health first aid um legislation that every workplace should have them but like i'm saying you know you you're actually creating more problems by doing that right. so we th this is um this isn't mature enough 
to to make any kind of legislation like mm. that especially when right now we're we're still trying to battle with the legislation that is in place <laughs> mm. um so that's a, a complete other journey which is a part of our third package which is about preventing work-related stress mm-hmm. so the hsc have had legislation in place since 1974 and 1999 that makes an employer responsible for doing a stress risk assessment and acting on it and Mm. preventing workplace stress basically Mm. you you look after the health and well-being of your employees since 2009 um workplace stress was a health priority for the hsa yet they haven't been enforcing it they Mm. haven't had um, inspectors coming out and um, and enforcing these companies not using stress risk assessments or even take an action to prevent work-related stress so we've just continued to see it grow and get higher and higher and higher it's interesting i've had a couple of clients come to me and say michelle how can we recruit super resilient people (laughs) that aren't going to get stressed and like you're asking me the wrong question it's like what's wrong with your workplace yeah that you need super resilient people and those people sadly do not exist no human can stand a level of stress you know yeah indefinitely so it's yeah it's an interesting kind of saying well you know there are tests to see how well people can cope with stress but you know, if you keep throwing humans at the problem, they'll all, uh, they'll all end up burning out. Mm-hmm. You're responsible for them. You know, you need to keep people safe at work. Yeah. So what reasonable adjustments can you make to your workplace yeah. to make sure people don't need to be superhuman mm-hmm. to, to survive? There? Yeah, yeah. But a lot of organisations are not willing to do that. It, it's no. like it's the, it's the job that's too hard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's too hard for them to do. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it can be really frightening to really lift the lid off this stuff and go, oh, why is the majority of our sickness absence due to work-related stress? A lot mm. a lot of the time, the answer is there's too many demands for the number of people that you have. Mm. Yeah. And then companies just go, well, we can't afford to employ more staff. So it, it, it's definitely one of the harder things to do. Mm-hmm. But what we're seeing is there's been a couple of changes over the past couple of months, really. Um, so the World Health Organization have now classified burnout into the is it the ICD International ID, IDC International Cla- ICD <laughs> International <laughs> Classification of Diseases. I always get stuff the long way around. Um, so burnout is classed as a phenomena that is caused by work-related stress. So you can't have burnout from home-related stress. Mm-hmm. It is only from the workplace. So we're now starting to classify this. So it's classified in there. It's not classed as a medical condition yet, but it, it's coming. Yeah. You know, it, it's going to get to the point where at the end of the day, if you cause burnout because of work-related stress, mm-hmm. you've created a psychological injury. Mm-hmm. And it should be the same as if your employee breaks their arm because you didn't give them the right equipment or you made it unsafe. Mm-hmm. It's, it should be the same thing. Yeah, it's, it's when the ambulance chasing solicitory lawyer type humans get wind of that mm. and the adverts go out on, you know, during, I was going to say Jeremy Carl, but that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> but, um, you know, daytime TV, that's when employers will mm. s- suddenly mm. sit up because they're going to be hit hard where the, mm. in, their, in their pockets, in I their suppose. Pockets. And it's an interesting one. So this this will definitely be a journey to keep your eyes open for. So that happened with the World Health Organization. And then two weeks ago, I think, um, the health and safety executive launched their new campaign called Go Home Healthy. Mm. So they're focusing on three specific areas. And they're sending out inspectors who are going to inspect with a health focus. So they're looking at dust, musculoskeletal, and work-related stress. Mm -hmm. They're looking at dust first, then musculoskeletal. So this is time if you're an employer <laughs> to make sure that you're yeah. you you're covering your backside really, but you're also helping to keep your staff mentally well. Mm-hmm. Um, that you're compliant with the current legislation. So the HSC are, are giving people, they're giving employers a little bit of time here, you know, mm. to 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 do something. Um, they've set the HSC have set out the stall. They're going to come in and do these inspections. Once they come in and do these inspections, there is legislation there that they can use to enforce. If you're not 
and if you're not complying with the current legislation <laughs> so make of that what you will be as scared of it as you want to be i suppose it's the problem is if you're a company that then go oh now we need to do something because we're going to get told off by hsa rather than morally we need to keep our employees healthy mm. Mm. then you know that's it's a reputational thing as well isn't it yeah no you're totally right it's gonna be interesting times ahead i think yeah yeah definitely with hsa i think mm. it's only a matter of time before we'll see that first case study yeah of big company enforced mm. not doing stress risk assessments you know nine percent of the workforce are off of work related stress mm -hmm. no prevention in place so our third program is around that it's around helping companies to make sure that they're, they're legally complying but that they're doing and taking action mm. to um, find out what the pain points are and take an action to reduce them and minimize them and completely take them away if, mm. if we can yeah excellent yeah can that be a company of any size, any sector, public, private, any yeah. type of organisation? Is that yeah? As long as the humans, as long as the humans, <laughs> okay. <laughs> or dancers. <laughs> <laughs> Only the oldies will get that one. <laughs> yeah, we we generally tend to find that um, our clients are, are more corporate. Mm -hmm. um, we specialise in working with bigger organisations. Mm -hmm. um, over over 600 staff um up to a couple of thousand we can mm -hmm. quite comfortably work with and, uh, and engage with that yeah. level of intervention with them yeah mm. we we see the work that we do is we relationship build we're not ticky box mm -hmm. so some of the companies that we've worked with we've been working with for three years mm -hmm. um and it's about continuing to help them and support them it needs to become embedded yeah. It needs to become self-sustaining. It needs mm -hmm. to become part of their culture and part of their values that, you know, their employees being healthy is like the number one aim. Mm -hmm. Because if your employees are healthy, you're going to have much higher levels of engagement, mm -hmm. you know, productivity. And I don't know if there are any awards, are there, that are linked to that? I know there's the, like the Sunday Times best places to work list, but I don't know mm -hmm. if that includes anything that questions mental health at all. I think a, l sure. a lot of the wards are asking for companies to identify what they are doing around mental health okay. and well-being. Mm -hmm. um, so one of our clients has literally just won the number one place to work in the Northeast. Mm, great stuff. Yeah. Uh, a couple of our other clients have been winning awards around what support we've been offering, the work that they've been engaged in with mental health in the workplace as well. So mm -hmm. the company, the, these awards are asking, you know, what are you doing about this? I think mm. it's definitely a hot topic at the moment. Mm. Yeah. So, going back to you. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Feels weird talking about me. I know. Um, <laughs> I can tell. Um, <laughs> if you had to go back and speak to that 16-year-old you oh sleeping gosh. on the sofa downstairs because it's too scary upstairs, what advice would you give her? God, it's such a difficult question. Mm. Like, it really is. I don't know. I really don't know. And... Uh, I think one of the things about the way that I live my life is that I don't regret any of it. Mm. I, I have literally lived mm -hmm. life and learned from it and not just bounced back. I'm not just resilient. I've transcended a lot of the problems that I've had and the challenges that I've experienced. And then I just crack on and get on with it, you know, and I, I never look back and go, wow, I really regret that or I should have done this differently. Mm -hmm. Um so I don't think, I don't think I would have said anything different. Uh, there's no little nugget of advice that I think, oh, if somebody just said this to us, it was probably more around other people looking looking out for each other. Mm. I think for me, I think that was a big thing that was missing from the workplace and from your kind of family and friends. But I know that is changing now because we are talking a lot more about mental ill health mm. and how to spot the signs. And then if you do, what you can say, you know, and have that conversation. So I think we're, we're definitely changing that now. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for me, that that was probably what was missing. Um, I learned a lot from from that from how I brought up my own daughter though. That's mm. definitely one thing that I learned was um, how I didn't want to parent my daughter. So even though I was 18, I had a very, very clear idea of the things that I didn't 
wanted to feel and I didn't want to experience mm -hmm. and literally had to chuck her out last year because I was sick of her. I was like, get out, get out. No, I'm <laughs> joking. <laughs> <laughs> she wanted to leave, honestly. <laughs> she grew up and became, you know, a, a, a young woman and mm -hmm. a job and a house and a cat and, you know, she, I speak to her every day and we have a really cl close relationship and I think that, that for me is just the biggest achievement. Mm. And without going through what I went through, I might not have achieved it the way that I did. Yeah. So Wonderful. I'm quite happy with that. Food for thought. Yeah. So if, if that's... Um, are you going to say the same question, weren't you? Yeah, I was just waiting. You, you do, you do this bit so much better than I do. <laughs> that will probably get a lot of people thinking. Business owners, HR directors, people who manage teams. If that's something they'd like to chat to you about, what's mm -hmm. the best way to get in touch? Yeah, so email, LinkedIn, through our website. Um, I'm happy just to take a phone call. So all of my details are on my LinkedIn account uh, or they can contact us through the website, which is ourmindswork.com. Uh, so pretty easy to remember. Cool. Awesome. Thank you ever so much <laughs> for no coming worries. in today. Thank Thanks. You, Emily. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks. Didn't get me sugar free biscuits, man. Can I just go? <laughs> <laughs> I'm leaving that bit in. <laughs> <laughs>